Live from ClickOrlando.com, this is News 6 at 5.30. This is a News 6 Plus takeover. Here now is Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells with Talk to Tom. Hi there, everyone. I'm Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells. Welcome back to another episode of Talk to Tom. It's kind of my own little podcast version of the original Talk to Tom. We started this back in 2004, just talking, bantering back and forth with you, the viewer at home. Normally, we do it during a hurricane, but we've come to understand that people like it, want a chance to ask questions. So it has become this. Every Thursday afternoon here between 530 and 6, we do Talk to Tom. If you'd like to submit your questions, we'll tell you how to do that a little later. For now, Let's get to rolling. Our first question comes from our friend, Allie. Hello, Allie. Hello, my name is Allie. I just recently moved to Florida from Ohio, and I bet that you can guess the tremendous changes that I've experienced <laughs> in these past couple of months, especially if you live in Florida. Um, for starters, Ohio has all four seasons within a couple months, whereas Florida has all four seasons within a day, except for snow. Um, it's just crazy to me that it could be absolutely beautiful and sunny and then you go a couple feet down the road and it's downpouring and then a couple feet further and it's sunny again. So why is that? Allie, 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 Allie from Ohio. Welcome to Central Florida. Allie, Allie, I used to live in Ohio. I did. I know all about that. I went to Ohio State. O-H? Can I get an I-O? Allie, great question. Um, the weather is going to be one of the big adaptive changes you're going to have to make here in Central Florida. But here's here's the main difference between whether here in Central Florida and in Ohio in the Midwest. And the big difference is we're mostly, almost exclusively, an air mass driven weather experience. And what do I mean by that? What do I mean is we don't have a cold front coming through every other day or every third day. We're not expecting our cold fronts and our warm fronts to be our main drivers of our rain. So what happens here in Central Florida is our tropical air mass is in place. It depends on how dry that air mass is or how much moisture we have and where the sea breeze is to bring us our rain. So what is happening to you is that instead of a cold front marching in from the plains, running right through the heart of Central Ohio and producing a line of rain that rocks and then gradually drying out and no more rain, we have pop-up showers all over the place from time to time. And that's kind of what you'll experience here. It will be pouring like crazy on the front of your house and sun shining in your backyard. Welcome to Florida. And by the way, the food here is not the food in central Ohio or northern Ohio or even Cincinnati. But we do have new restaurants that are opening, Skyline Chili, all that kind of stuff. So welcome to Central Florida Alley. I hope I answered your question well enough. If not, give me a call. Love talking to Buckeyes. OH. Our next question is from our friend George. Hello, George. A friend of mine says it's impossible to predict the weather. What would you say to someone like that? I would actually say we do a better job now than we have ever done of predicting the weather. I think that weather, much like this is the best time to ever be alive, weather has never been more forecastable if that is a word. The forecast has never been more precise. Our three-day forecast is almost dead on. Our seven-day forecasts are pretty good. Our 90-day outlooks are getting better. And so I would think that now, much like it's the best time to ever be alive based on how much food we have, what your standard of living is. We even have vaccines now that can beat back the new viruses instead of having like the plague take over the planet, we can beat it back. This is also the best time to be alive when it comes to weather forecasting. We've done a much better job of uh, making it better, more precise. That's why I can call it the pinpoint weather forecast. We can pinpoint the hours of rain almost down to a T. Sometimes it still messes up and goes awry, but for the most part, we nail it day in and day out. And the biggest change, George, the biggest change in all of that is computation. Our computer's ability to look, take the numbers, numbers in and numbers out, algorithms, that's what's made the difference. Our ability to compute has made the difference. All right, next question. Tom, when it says there's a 10% chance of rain, does that mean a 10% chance of rain everywhere or is it only gonna rain in 10% of the area? I don't know. Well, George, you have hit upon 
a powder keg of controversy. This is a subject that we talk about in the meteorological community amongst ourselves, and not everyone comes to agreement. According to the National Weather Service, what we're supposed to do is take the coverage area, multiply it by your confidence in your forecast, and that's your chance of rain. So for example, if about 30% of the area is gonna get rain, and your confidence in that forecast is, say, eight out of 10, then you take 30 times 0.8, and you come up with your percentage. Try to figure it out. Basically, what it means is a probability of precipitation, a POP, a pop, as we call it. So in probability of precipitation, that's normally broken down county by county, kind of like almost a warning would be for um, severe weather. So when you look at my forecast and I say, Rain chances are 40% tomorrow. What I really mean is that about 40% of the area that I forecast for, from Ocala to Flagler County, all the way down to the southern tip of Osceola and Brevard, in that county line outline, about 40% of the area has a chance of seeing rain. Probably will see rain in my estimation. We also do a very good job now of changing things around to where, not only are we talking statistically, like if I believe it's going to rain south and east of Orlando, which is something I talk about all the time. Hey, there's going to be a bullseye. Rain chances are 40%, but most of that's going to be down here. I can graphically show you with my modeling what I mean. So that rain chances for the entire area are 40%, but they're actually concentrated in Bavard County. That legitimately would mean if I were just doing only Bavard County, rain chances would have to rocket to almost 90 or 50% if it's only Southern Bavard. So for the entire area that I'm forecasting for, mm, rain chance is about 40%. 40% of the area will see the rain, but I can show you graphically where that rain is going to be. So it's a great question. It caught fire on social media a couple of years ago, and people come up to me at restaurants, ball games, no matter where I am, and ask me that same exact question. Thank you. All right. Next question comes to us from Rebecca Perkins. Hey, Rebecca. Well, Tom, I'd like to know, when is it going to be cold enough for the manatees to come here into Florida so that I can see them? Oh, you're wanting to go up to Blue Springs and check out the manatees, the sea cows, as they're called. I love the manatee, too, and I love to watch them in the water and count them. It's so much fun. But the deal is, when it's warm, they stay out in the ocean waters or out in the other lagoons and they don't come swimming upstream. The water coming out of the springs here is 72 degrees. So obviously the manatee really dig that. The temperature that you need for things to really drive them in is any cold snap that is extended. If we get a cold front that comes through here and all of a sudden it's say 68 degrees for a daytime high, you won't get many manatee coming in. But the manatee do not like it when it goes below 65. And when it goes below 65, well below 65 for more than two or three days, you get an extended cold snap, they come running. Well, you know, swimming, they come swimming with the quickness, trying to get in to stay warm in the warm waters of the spring. 72 degrees obviously is not warm enough for you and I to survive in. If we were trying to stay in 72 degree water, we would eventually hypothermiate for the manatee. They start struggling when the water temperature goes below about 65 or so. So when it gets really, really cold and the air temperature is below 65 and the water starts to chill out, they know it and they come running and hide. So if you're trying to see hundreds of them or thousands of them or tens and twenties of them, chances are you'll do better if you wait until we have an extended cold snap with daytime highs 65 or below for at least four or five, six days. I've been out there before when all of a sudden we had a cold snap and it ended quickly. And by the time I got there, it was all over. No more, um, no more manatee in the water. I ended up one year seeing maybe, I don't know, three or 400 in one year seeing four or five. So it really does depend on your timing. All right. If you have a weather question you'd like to be answered, just go to clickorlando.com slash talk to Tom. We'd love to get you on here, answer your questions, see what's happening where you live. Coming up, we're going to take a look at the viral weather videos from right here in Florida and break down what they are, how, and why it all happens. Stay with us.
Hi there. Welcome back to Talk to Tom. I am Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells. If you missed the first part of our show today, we answered some questions from you, the viewers at home. Now we want to check out some viral video from right here in Florida and talk about how it all happens. First, we're going to start with water spouts. That's a big one. Head east. 38, here it comes. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. Quote of the day. Let's get out of here. Uh, I do appreciate the great video. Um, that water spout is um, something to look at and behold. Reason being, there's two or three different ways we can get a water spout going. That one was tied to a thunderstorm cloud. So sometimes you get a water spout that's not really tied to a thunderstorm. Is just tied to swirling wind. You can get a water spout that way. But that particular water spout in Destin was tied to a thunderstorm. And the only reason it wasn't a tornado is that it was out over the open water. That was a well-developed tornadic spin that made contact with the Gulf of Mexico and was rolling toward land. Here's a tip. Anytime you see a vortex, a tornado, a water spout, a cold air funnel, any of that stuff aloft, and it appears to you that it's not moving, chances are it's coming toward you, either quickly or slowly. But if you're looking at it and you can't tell, is that going north, south, is it going this way or that way, and it doesn't appear to be getting smaller, chances are it's coming toward you. You need to take cover. So back to water spouts. The way that one started is that it was just like any other tornado. We had a big thunderstorm going on. You had winds rolling aloft that eventually got spun down to the surface. And so that was just a tornado. It happened over the water. So that was a big time water spout. Sometimes that's not what we have. Sometimes we don't get the big one. Sometimes we get a much smaller storm doing its thing. Even our friends at Disney are not immune to funnel clouds. Look at this one. See that? That's kind of a smaller funnel. It's not particularly tied to a lot of lightning. It is not truly tornadic. It's only a funnel, a little funnel cloud that didn't last long. We were actually fortunate to have captured this. This is one of those things that happened over the Disney area that the Weather Service didn't even bother with much, didn't issue a warning on. We didn't have a, a tornado warning for Disney at that moment. And that particular funnel was short-lived, short-lived, did not last long at all, as opposed to that big, big water spout that was rocking there in Destin that was tied to the big time thunderstorm cloud. This one was just an example of a little bit of wind spinning around, a little lift coming up, a little heat coming off the ground, and all of a sudden we ended up with a funnel that did not touch ground, didn't make contact, didn't tear anything up at all. They can still do damage if they do make contact with the surface. And in the Midwest, like Ali from Ohio was on earlier asking about the differences in weather between Ohio and Florida. You get around the Great Lakes area, and even in the Northwest, we used to get what we call cold air funnels, which are kind of a cold air version of a uh, dust devil that we get here in the summertime or on hot days here. Cold air funnels are when cold air aloft is coming in and moving so rapidly over a little bit of a warm surface that all of a sudden it starts to interact and spin. And when that spin gets to go and you get a cold air funnel, it looks just like a thunderstorm tornado, but it's smaller, kind of like the example of what we had there at Disney. So your cold air funnels, your weaker water spouts, or even some of those small funnel clouds like that one over Disney. Not super dangerous unless they do make contact, they can tear up an awning. Those are what we call the EF zeros. They don't do much damage at all. But the ones tied to the thunderstorms like the one in Destin, okay, that one was pretty nasty. And we all remember this from Hurricane Ian, the fire ants floating on the water. If you look over there, you'll see a, a, a tan circle. What that tan circle is, is the fire ants that are in the ground, they find something to float on, and that's now a, a floating mound of fire ants. If, if they float by you, they're going for higher, drier ground, and that's you, and that's the last thing you want. Yeah, if you've ever been bitten by a fire ant, I don't have to tell you. The last thing you want is to encounter thousands or millions of them like that. That's just gross. They have some way of staying alive. Well, they all latch onto one another. They become their own float and they take turns at the top to stay alive. 
they actually cooperate to stay alive until they get a hold of you. All right, we're going to talk about um, my personal weather experiences. People ask a question about the weirdest weather events I personally have ever encountered. And I can run through a bunch. I could talk all day. I've lived in a lot of places. But I think my favorite pretty weather event, I'm not a snow guy. I'm not. I'm a summer guy. I'm a beach guy. I want to be where the water is warm and the drinks are cold, not where the air is cold and the drinks are hot. I want warm water, cool drinks. So I was on an AMS conference in Minnesota way, way back, like 2001. And there was a big thunderstorm, one of those big Midwestern thunderstorms. And when it was over, we were feeling the cool air pour out and the Mamanis clouds were forming. And I'd never seen them quite as pronounced as they were that day. And they were beautiful and filled up the whole overhead sky. So seeing Mamanis clouds in person was one of the coolest weather events I've ever been in. Um, I personally have never seen a tornado up close like that guy in Destin that shot that video. I mean, how fortunate. A, that he wasn't injured. B, he didn't struck by lightning. C, he got to experience that tornado. I, um, I came close one time, but I was in a, a rain-wrapped tornado at my mother and father's house back in Greenbrier, Tennessee in 19... I want to say it was 94? 90, hold on. No, it was 1998. It was April of 1998. And I went to the front door to watch. I was watching Channel 5 in Nashville. They were tracking on the Doppler radar, said it was right across Highway 41. And I did the thing you're not supposed to do. I went right to the front door to watch the tornado. And the storm door caved in and hit me in the head. And so when I say stay away from doors and windows during a tornado, that is the reason why. That's the closest I've ever come to seeing a tornado. Couldn't see it. Worst hurricane. My worst hurricane personally that I ever survived was Hurricane Hugo. September of 1989, September 21st and September 22nd of 1989. That was a category four storm, still rocking when it came through Florence, South Carolina. The building was kind of shaking, the roof was popping. Um, also Hurricane Charlie here in this very building, in this newsroom, in that studio, was awful. The most damage to my house was Hurricane Irma. So those are my three big hurricanes. Biggest snow, spring, First day of spring, Detroit, Michigan, it snowed more than eight inches. Actually shut down schools that day. That's the biggest one day snow total I've ever seen personally. It was about eight and a half, nine. Some areas had 10 inches. It shut down school in Detroit, which is hard to do because they just don't stop for snow. Um, coldest temperature I've ever felt was about minus 20 or minus 23. It was the Arctic outbreak in January of 1994. And it was really super cold. We had a lot of cold snaps back in the early 90s. Um, I remember moving to Ohio and November of 91 was super cold, like fourth coldest on record. But January of 1994 was weird. And we had big time Arctic issues and temperatures went below zero and went to minus 23. And I was at a place called Seven Springs, Pennsylvania, s s uh, skiing snow skiing. It was 1994, Seven Springs. It was Martin Luther King weekend. It was the day of the big earthquake in California. Like one of the LA earthquakes happened at the same time because I watched that on TV while I was a Tom Sickle out there on the ski slopes. We, we had clothes. We were built for it, but that's the coldest I've ever felt. Minus 23 on the ski slopes in Seven Springs, Pennsylvania. I want to hear from you. I want to hear your questions here on Talk to Tom. If you'd like to submit a question, please do so. You could submit it anytime. Just go to clickorlando.com slash talk to Tom. That's clickorlando.com slash talk to Tom. We'll dial you up, record you, or try to get you on live to talk to me. And of course, you can always check us out anytime on Talk to Tom on News 6 Plus. And while you're there, check out Florida's Fourth Estate. I think it's kind of cool to be able to show both sides and maybe like get other people's attention or show girls that it's cool to be a scientist because a lot of mainstream media is not doing that. Florida foodie. It's yes. like creamy and it's like strong. <laughs> yeah. It hit her. Yeah. She's going to be you, jumping you, on wow, the table. Wow, that is it's delicious. the condensed yeah. milk. Yeah. Yes. Riff on this and live cams. 
Hundreds of people sit down just to enjoy the beach from home, overlook the city beautiful, or watch the cruise ships come in. It's all available free on News 6 Plus. Just download the app on your TV and start watching.